I'm Don Rittner. And I'm Justina Kostik. We're about to go on a journey down the second oldest turnpike in America. That's where the Great Western Turnpike originated in 1799 in Albany, New York. And it went about 60 miles west to Cherry Valley, New York. So let's take a ride and learn about the fascinating history along the way. Before there were throughways and byways, simple wagon roads were carved between villages in America. In Albany, New York, the earliest road was the King's Highway. It was cut between the two Dutch settlements of Albany and Schenectady and went 16 miles to the west. In 1794, the first toll-based turnpike was built between Lancaster and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. But soon after, in 1799, the Great Western Turnpike was built between Albany and Cherry Valley, some 52 miles to the west making it the second oldest turnpike in America. Why were they called turnpikes? Well, if you didn't pay the toll, you turned around. And if you tried to drive through it, you could get a pike coming down on your head. Today, people drive over a modern road in Albany County called Western Avenue, but have no idea this once was the major way to Western New York and beyond. Along the turnpikes were toll markers that showed the distance to your destination and toll houses where you stopped and paid the toll. And toll markers came in all different shapes and sizes, but always had the mile number on them. The Great Western was a toll road. Thousands of stagecoaches, wagons, and people used this road to move west during the 19th century. There were two toll houses between Albany and nearby Gilderland and a now forgotten settlement called the Glass House. Toll houses were stopped by a tollkeeper, but often the whole family lived there as it was a full-time job. Toll houses were spaced along the turnpike based on how much traffic the toll companies thought they could make. Sometimes there was a road that ran parallel to the turnpike called a shunpike, so that local travelers could escape the tolls, but those roads were usually not as well maintained as the toll roads. Our first stop would be at the former glass factory site, now the town of Gilderland, off Western Avenue and Willow Street. The area was settled in the late 18th century, and over 50 houses and factories were built, including the Dalsberg Glass Works, one of the earliest glass factories in America, and also an iron foundry. In the early 1960s, the late museum director Louis Ismay partially excavated the glass factory with his students and located a large section of the works. We wanted to learn more about the history of the glass factory and the surrounding community, and we'll stop at the John Schoolcraft Historic Site and talk to Gilderland town historian Ann Wimpleperson. factories in America, wasn't it? Why? It, it was one of the earlier ones in America. There were some in Europe, but this was one of the early ones in the U.S. Um, this area had all the ingredients to make glass, sand, potash, wood, and the water from the hunger kill. Wow. And why put a glass house here so far from Albany? Well, the resources were here. The, the potash, the, the sand, the water, yes. the wood. Yes. So it was a perfect location to make a glass factory. But you said, you know, they had a great year in 1813, but only two years later they went out of business. So what happened? Yeah, what happened there? <laughs> yeah, they, uh, there was a combination of factors. There was a little bit of infighting, but they ran out of resources. It was just depleted, the wood ran out, and it was just 
cheaper to get your glass from Europe. So it was a competition from Europe that kind of killed it. Yes, it did. So this is a beautiful house. Was this built by one of the glass makers? Or? Well, not exactly. Uh, the Schoolcrafts were involved with this house, but John Schoolcraft built this house in somewhere between 1835 and 1845. And it was a summer home for his family and himself from Albany. He used to have a lot of money. <laughs> the, yes, they yeah. did. It's like a beautiful Gothic <laughs> revival house. And this was a summer house? You can imagine see what his where the city house was. Yeah, yeah, this, this, he lived in Albany and this was the summer house for the family. What did he do for a living though? I mean, how did he make money? Well, a few things. He was a wholesale grocer, he was a banker, he was very active in New York state politics, and then from 18, late 1840s to early 1850s, he was a New York state congressman. Wow. Yeah, so he had a little bit of wealth. Interesting. And was he a relative to Henry Schoolcraft? John was the uncle to Henry Schoolcraft. Oh. Yes. And who was Henry Schoolcraft? Henry uh, did a few things. Very early in his life, he was involved with some glass making, but then he just went on to be a geologist, a geographer, and an ethnographer, and studied Native American culture and was a prolific writer. Yeah, didn't he write, like, he wrote a six-volume set of all North American Indian tribes. Yes, exactly. So, which at the time was a tremendous undertaking. Yes. he And, and not get killed by anybody. Exactly, yes. Yeah, he was very dedicated and, and immersed himself in the study of Native American culture and history. Wasn't his first wife a Native American? Yes, yeah, she was part Native American. Uh, her name was Jane. She was a writer as well and uh, they had a couple of children. Uh, he then married again uh, to Mary, and Mary seemed to be the opposite of Jane. Um, Mary was uh, pro-slavery. She was from the South, from South Carolina. She even wrote a best-selling book called The Black Gauntlet, which was pro-slavery. Uh, that came out in about 1860, eight or so years after Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. So it was almost a response, I'd like say, a to that. to Uncle Tom's Cabin. Yes, exactly. Well, that must have been strange living, since his first wife was Native American. He had mixed, <laughs> mixed race children, and yeah. he was married to a, a racist. Yeah, I, from my understanding that the relationship with his children and Mary, it was very strained because she was pro-slavery and her husband had mixed race children. So that was, it was not a good relationship. I wonder how they even got together. I wonder too, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So tell us more about the house. I mean, it looks like you're, who owns the house now? The town of Gilderland owns this house. Uh, it was restored and refurbished. It took many years of hard work but it is uh, owned by the town of Gilderland. So it gets some use. It's still a work in progress. There's a little bit more work to do, but um, it's, it's a nice location for small groups and historic events. Was this named after Alexander Hamilton, who was from Albany, which is close to G Gilderland? Yes, the area where the glass factory was they established 50 to 60 homes and Hamilton and Schuyler helped back some of that uh, development. So it was called Hamilton in honor of Alexander Hamilton and the Glassworks factory was renamed Hamilton Glassworks. Was he one of the investors here at some point? He and Schuyler wow. apparently were investors in the Glassworks and, and helped back some of that. The Hamilton Street is just a few streets over, so I think there has been a little bit more interest. I haven't seen a lot of interest in people wanting to tour this building, but there has been a little bit more interest, I think. Yeah, I know the Skyler Mansion in Albany has seen a real increase in tourism since the play has been out. And what about like a museum? Uh, like a, would there be any kind of, you know, artifacts or, or tours or... Um... 
you know, history of guild work. We have done some tours here. Uh, the second floor isn't complete, so we can't have people up there yet. It's a work in progress. But we do have some tours come through here and we're hopeful that we can do that more and that we can have more events here and um, make it a place, a destination for people to visit. Our next stop along the Turnpike is the town of Duanesburg in Schenectady County with a population of 361 residents. Founded by New York City Mayor James Duane in the 18th century, he wanted to turn this beautiful land into the capital of New York State. He purchased thousands of acres, but the first thing he did was build an Episcopal church as a centerpiece. Fortunately for the area, it never happened. Duanesburg settled to become a small hamlet instead. So we are going to stop at Duane's church along the turnpike and learn more about the history from Bart McDougall, a preacher at the church. Maybe Duanesburg did not become the capital of New York, but its residents still made great contributions to American history. So Bart, this is a beautiful church. Thank you very much. Can yes. you tell us a little bit about the history? Yes, I can. <clears throat> For one thing, we're one of the few places I know of that have three, count them three, New York State historic markers out front. North Church Duane, William North, Christ Church, and James Duane here commemorated. <clears throat> uh, we, we are located at Churches Plural Row. The reason it's called Duanesburg Churches Road is because there used to be another church across the way uh, which burned somewhere uh, around 1950, around Christmas time. As you come in, you'll notice from the outside that it looks like a house, That's a right. sort of a center hall colonial house. How very appropriate, because it's God's house. And as you come in, you'll see that what used to be uh, you thought of as the front, whoa, all of a sudden it's the back, not uncommon among churches. You'll notice several uh, interesting phenomena. The dome ceiling, which uh, suggests the firmament at creation, where God is sort of protecting and gathering his family, his children, his brood together. You'll notice that uh, <clears throat> the pulpit is a raised so-called wine glass pulpit uh, from a design by Sir Christopher Wren uh, of uh, St. Paul's Cathedral in London fame, that is to say New St. Paul's, the old one having uh, left this earth uh, in the Great Fire of London in 1666. Uh, it's a, a Georgian uh, Palladian or Palladian window there, uh, sounding board, octagonal in shape, which is duh, obvious. Uh, we have the box pews, and they used to be heatable by uh, two shaker-style stoves, one at the back of each side, uh, and the, these stones, one of which is still extant in here, uh, were heated up by the minister, of course, uh, so that the ladies arriving by carriage could keep their tootsies warm in the otherwise frigid environment uh, of this place in, in the 1790s and more recently. Uh, what happened to the stoves? They were both stolen separately because the vestry couldn't decide what to do with them, so they put them under the shed for now until they decided. Well, they didn't learn their lesson the first one, so they lost the second one as well. Those who do not 
learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I didn't invent that, somebody else did. The layout continuing. Uh, over here was the Duane Pew. We still call it the Duane Pew. You might notice that it's just one little step up, a little higher than the rest of you. And it was separated from the altar by a red velvet curtain, such that they, the Duanes, could see what was going on up here, but that you <coughs> couldn't see them. So you wouldn't be distracted by the founding family. The tablets uh, on the wall commemorate uh, the people whose mortal part here rests until that day, uh, Advent 2, when Jesus comes back. They're down there, and no, you can't get there. You can't get in there because the, the floor of the church is the ceiling of the crypt, and nobody's been there since we wrapped the ductwork uh, back in the 80s to make sure that when the air got to the fire uh, pew, it was still actually warm. We now, by the way, have air conditioning. Boy, not historic, but anyway. We have the, uh, this, this church is pulpit-centered. Uh, that may not be strange for many uh, Protestant churches, but it's very, very odd for Episcopal churches still extant because the, the altar needs to be center and the pulpit is normally off to one side or the other. During the time and during the mental state of, of Europe at the time this was constructed, the word took precedence over the sacrament. Uh, interestingly, I always thought the preaching of the word was reached almost on the same level to the poor people, the hired hands and so on, who sat up in the gallery. <laughs> so that the preacher spoke right to them and then it would fall down on the people whose names or numbers were on the pews that they rented. You can still see on the doors of the pews a sort of clipped uh, rectangle, which makes it octagonal, duh, uh, which uh, told which, which pew you were paying for. The MacDougall pew, I'm Bart MacDougall, uh, is back the third one uh, between Justine and, and Howard Historian. 1974, uh, we had a terrible fire across the way. Uh, the whole, the barn and the house, it was March 14th, 1974, it was a March wind. Uh, and the church was saved by the only part of it that was not period authentic. It had an asbestos roof. And that's what saved the church. That's a near miss. I got a second one. I still have time. <clears throat> 1978, it's Christmas Eve, we're here. It's a, uh, it's a raging snowstorm outside. It was about six or seven inches of snow when we came in. The place is pretty full, uh, <clears throat> and somebody said that they thought they smelled uh, fuel oil or something. I said to my friend who was on the board, well, go out and check in the furnace room, and I'll go get a, an extinguisher. Well, I had a 30-pound guy chem red over here. So you can imagine no amount of nonchalance was going to go unnoticed. So I started back out with it, and I heard some older female voice, fire, like that. And, I, and the minister turned around. He was consecrating. I said, that's all right, Father. Just continue your business. We'll take care of it. He said, all right, Father. And he went on. He was from Boston, I think. Anyway, uh, off we went, and my friend had put the fire out with snow. And so, you know, what is the likelihood that in the middle of a snowstorm on Christmas Eve, the fire was put out because there were all kinds of people here? And some of them, the storm got so bad, they couldn't even get home. 
they had to stop at, at neighbors who were nearby. The bell was uh, from the Centennial, uh, from the Manili Bell Works uh, in Troy, New York, uh, 1893. And the cost of the bell was $294.01. Uh, and everybody donated uh, to the, the bell, and even the Sunday school must have, because I knew a guy who was about Sunday school age, whose name is, is printed in the list of donors. He has now, of course, gone to his greater reward. James Duane, by the way, was the first mayor of New York City under the Constitution. So he, he, was, uh, he was a fairly established individual, who never, by the way, lived in Duanesburg. He, his foundation was up, uh, but he uh, became history uh, before anything more than that happened. James Duane put tenants on this property, and they owed him chickens and a couple of days' work with a team a year. Well, they wrote to him, and they were pleading that out of his goodness, he might give them some kind of help. And I have a, a portion of a very nice, respect, respectful letter, obviously from lower class to upper class, and it just, it just shouts to be repeated. It is written as follows. We, your most loyal and dutiful tenants, have lived here now three years, that is from 1765 to 68, that the town was formed in 65, of course everybody knows that, and have not been able to raise our bread yet. The first year the vermins destroyed it, the second our crops froze out of the ground and our wheat turned into drips. And this year at the present time, April 15, 1768, there is no sign of spring yet, whereas the snow is yet at the present time in Duanesburg a, a foot and a half deep, and so hard there is no sign of spring. So they were, they were trying to get some relief from him. Boy, it's hard to imagine this area looking like New York City. It's amazing how one person's dream could have such an impact on geography. I was amazed the church was built the same year that Marie Antoinette said, let them eat cake. You know, she lost her head on the guillotine for that statement. I guess she got the biggest slice. Today it's hard to imagine Duanesburg becoming the capital of New York. But the history of James Duane and his church and his son-in-law William North was fascinating. Just two examples of early men who helped shape the American experience during the 18th century. Today we learned about an early glass factory and the almost capital of New York State along the Great Western Turnpike. We hope you enjoyed this adventure and we will see you next time on History, History on, on the, the Road. Road.
take a ride with us as we go explore. No, no, no. You oh, see, that's, that's right. the line because yeah, it's yeah. not balanced. It's yeah, it's yeah. academical. Okay. okay. Yeah? yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's do it again. Okay. So come take a ride with us as we learn about the fascinating history of the New York State. <laughs> no, it's not the wall. Get the right line. <laughs> what? I like it that way. <laughs>